influence on my life is my engagement in the visual arts. And I should say my engagement in the visual arts as a child. Uh, I had a cousin. Her name was Ethel. And she was an quote-unquote artist. She used to draw interesting stick figures and uh, it came a time where we would draw these forms together. As a result, my skill as an artist, quote unquote, grew and I got some recognition in school. For example, my fourth grade teacher gave me a one-person show. It was a one-man show in those days in the room. My fifth grade teacher, tell you a little story which is kind of interesting. Uh, I was good at drawing the unfurled American flag blowing in the wind with chalk on blackboard. And uh, my teacher said, Elliot, go into Miss Fitzmorris's room and she's expecting you and uh, draw an unfurled American flag on the blackboard so the kids can have something to look at and to salute in the morning. I went into the wrong room and I drew it anyhow. And the teacher must have thought, who's this kid <laughs> coming in to make a drawing on my blackboard? <laughs> the point being, I got acknowledgement and uh, took art courses in high school all four years with some wonderful teachers. This was really important to me because I graduated in the 20th percentile of my high school graduating class. That wasn't too sharp. I'd never get into any selective university today. I didn't get into a selective university then. I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. The point being that I was engaged in art and that called the qualitative world to attention for me. And uh, that grew and developed and provided a lot of satisfaction. What also influenced my thinking and my seeing were the arguments and debates that ensued in my house when my father in particular was entertaining our relatives. They generally after about 15 or 20 minutes, get into uh, political arguments. So these political arguments stimulated me because I can see the glint in their eye, the flush in their cheeks when they were so engaged. They didn't know that much about politics, but that didn't stop them. So what happened was I discovered the joy of intellectual process in my home as a young man. And uh, when I finished high school, I, as I said, went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago to study painting. And after there, being there for about a year and a half, I decided to leave and to try to make my way in the world of commercial art. So I became a commercial artist in the largest studio that exists probably in the world it's called the Vogue Wright Studio, and they did the catalogs for Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Ward, and I did a little itty bitty drawings showing the inside of a jacket that had a zipper in it, for example. I mean, it was, it was no big deal, but that's what I was paid to do, and also to make sure that the senior artists had the clothing that they were supposed to illustrate available to them when they needed it. That was not satisfying to me because it had no intellectual spirit and it wasn't really paying much attention to the aesthetics of the matter. It was strictly technical. So I transferred out of that job, went back to college, got a degree at Roosevelt University, both uh, in art and in education. Why education? I liked the issues that were 
being discussed in the educational field. I like the arguments. It was like being back home. And also, since most of the teachers were social scientists, that resonated with my own background because I was always interested in matters of justice and possibility and uh, having the opportunity to discuss these things in class gave me a leg up because I was able to discuss things that I already had discussed at home. We talked about social justice. We talked about minority groups. We talked about getting ahead in the world. Getting ahead was really important. My mother encouraged me to uh, become a commercial artist, not to become a teacher. She thought that I'd always be poor if I was a teacher. But I like the ideas in education. And after getting a bachelor's degree from Roosevelt, I took a master's degree at IIT. It's like MIT, but it's the IIT is uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. And I had the good fortune to go to a really fine School of Design, which is the Institute of Design at the Illinois Institute of Technology. The Institute of Design was an offshoot of the German Bauhaus, and uh, they prepared people to think in fresh and new ways about any kind of a design problem. The Parker 51 pen, the German Volkswagen, were products of the Institute of Design, and I had that kind of background. So. The nice thing about it was that I had a background from IIT, which was technological aesthetics, and I had a background from the Art Institute of Chicago, which was Beaux-Arts. And that combination was terrific for me to have both available. And uh, so I started teaching after I finished my second my first master's degree, I started teaching. And I went to the Chicago Public Schools as an art teacher. And I taught art classes at the Carl Schurz High School in Chicago. Opportunity to study more about education was important. But what was also important was my uncertainty about what I was doing as an art teacher. I didn't un really understand what I was doing. I was teaching art, but what did that mean? So I decided I needed more education, and I found it at the University of Chicago. I had applied to two schools for a master's degree. I applied to Northwestern University and to the University of Chicago. I got rejected from Northwestern and got accepted at the University of Chicago, which was one of the best things that happened to me. Uh, Chicago had a very strong faculty. And again, I found at Chicago the arguments and ideas and ideals and engagement that I experienced at home. So that really fit. So I moved into education without a lot of planning, planning vocations is an oxymoron, career planning is an oxymoron. Most people don't plan careers, they so to speak happen. I found at Chicago qualitative research, but it wasn't called it. And I found at Chicago, mo most importantly, uh, the opportunity to engage intellectually in the ideas and ideals of education. When I was at Chicago, I did a lot of writing. I've always written a lot. And one of my articles appeared in one of art education's journals that was read by the chairman of the art department, the art education department, I should say, at Ohio State University. And uh, he wrote to me and asked if I'd be interested in talking with him about a position at the Ohio State University. And that was my first induction. I took 
the opportunity, was offered the job, and took my first experience at the college level at Ohio State, not yet having finished my Ph.D. I was working on my dissertation. And that's a whole other story. So that'll give you some sense of the general route. And if I don't make my comments more brief, we'll be here until next Tuesday. If you, if you think, it, would that be useful? It's whatever you think. They were both emigres to this country. My father came over when he was 14. My mother came over when she was seven. They both grew up in the Ukraine, and they both worked hard in order to, as they said, make a living. Neither of them, with the exception of music, they weren't engaged in the visual arts at all. They were, my mother particularly, was engaged in opera and in classical music. She loved it. But when Metropolitan Opera came on on Saturdays, she gave me a dime to go to the movie so she could hear the, <laughs> the opera in, in, in a quiet house, uh, household. They both recognized that I had been successful. Uh, they didn't know much about the field of education, but they knew that I was doing okay. My father once asked me, when I invited him to attend uh, my graduation from the University of Chicago, went over their head, and he asked me, are you going to have a decal? A decal is Yiddish for a color, a cover. And he wanted to know whether I was going to get one of those. Aristotle once said, or at least was said to have said, man by nature seeks to know. Research in the broadest sense is an effort to know. And I believe that the forms of knowing vary enormously. That knowing that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is one kind of knowing. Knowing that the soil in a pot is of the right wetness is another form of knowing. Knowing what an apple tastes like is another. So there are different ways in which people come to know the world. Research is an effort to refine our knowledge of X, whatever X might be. And it's done within social constraints very often. Sometimes these constraints are too constraining and sometimes they're appropriate. So research is a process of inquiry in which a human being tries to know what it is that is under investigation. Qualitative research is an effort to explore the uses and effects of qualities in order to inform somebody about either his or her capacity to have experience in that domain or to use what has been qualified, and I'll come back to that in a moment, in order to understand what otherwise would not be available. Now, I said a lot in that paragraph. Let me try to refine it. If you take a film like Schindler's List, I hope you saw Schindler's List. Schindler's List is an amalgam of qualities, not excluding language, the ways in which language is used, the ways in which filmic processes are created, the kind of music that is played, the tempo of the discourse, collectively have an impact on the viewer and through that impact a person is made aware of the situation portrayed in a way that a bundle of statistics would never reveal. So when I said that qualitative research is the product of the qualification of qualities, when I say, let me back up a step, the word quality itself is systematically ambiguous. Quality in the vernacular often means something of high value, like this is a quality hotel room, or this is a quality meal, or this is a quality this or a quality that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 
qualities as, such as redness, hardness, softness, strength, weakness, etc., etc. So that a painter, for example, will take qualities of line and color and texture and composition and put them together by arranging them in ways in order to affect the experience of somebody else. And in so doing, aspects of the world are made vivid that otherwise would be dormant. So that with a Rodin or a Cezanne or a Renoir to take very important artists, the world begins to look like the image because the image illuminates aspect of the world that otherwise would not be seen. So art does not always imitate life. Life imitates art. The same is true in the sciences, incidentally. That is, if you learn a theory, you begin to, see, begin to see the world through the portals that that theory provides. People who make those theories we call scientists. People who make qualities we tend to call artists. I don't want to draw a distinction between art and science at the, this level. In fact, I'm pointing out that both art and both science are people who make structures that affect the way we see and come to know. Learning how to do that is one of the things that education ought to make possible. Well, when I was at Chicago, there wasn't anything called qualitative research, but people were doing research that looks like qualitative that looks like qualitative research today. Uh, Street Corner Society, for example, by William Foote White, was published in the late 40s, early 50s. That's a kind of sociological ethnography that made vivid the life of Italians in the northern section of Boston. But that was a rare species. It wasn't, in my view, until the 1950s with the publication of Life in Classrooms that we got a sense of what qualitative research could help us notice. Learning to notice what is, what is subtle but significant is extraordinarily important in education. Today we take it for granted that you need to know the side effects, not only the main effects of what you're doing. That people who have done qualitative research or who've argued the place for qualitative research have made possible and attractive to a younger generation of researchers. Not everybody needs to come out of a doctoral program with a quantitative orientation. For many people that's quite appropriate, but not for everybody. Some people are better served by being able to write a certain kind of narrative, for example, or to make films or videos, for example. I mean, the project that you are now engaged in is premised on the assumption, even if it's not articulated, that the visual image and the details of expression are going to be as informative or almost so as a text that, that could also be made of this. In fact, you could do a project where you take the interviews or an interview or two and make a TypeScript out of it and use the same in visual material and to see what differences it makes in the experience and understanding of viewers, whether you use film or video or text. Uh, so there is a change, a growing awareness that the culture provides different forms of representation that facilitate certain kinds of understanding, that promote certain kinds of awareness that are useful for different purposes. See, why do we 
use maps. It's a visual display. I sometimes say there, you know, there are two criteria that I had to use to select prospective teachers. These are what they would be. I'd like to know whether they can tell a story. And the second one, interestingly enough, is slipping me. A story because you have to organize your... Oh, I know what the second one was. First is the story. Second is getting directions to get go someplace. In a story, what you've got is language and ideas and images put together coherently. In getting directions, what you've got is being able to put yourself in the direction receiver's shoes in order to know what he or she needs to have in order for him or her to get where they want to go. And if they can't do that, I think prom <laughs> their promise as a teacher is probably limited. Well, multiple sources. One source certainly is John Dewey's book, Experience and Art is Experience. Uh, in chapter 13 of that book, he talks about criticism. Now, he says there that the aim of criticism is the re-education of the perception of the work of art. So a critic is somebody who writes or talks about an object in a way that enables somebody else to change and expand and diversify, refine the qualities that constitute some object or event. So a critic of ballet would talk about movement and how it unfolds over time. A critic of painting would talk about color relationships, let's say, and talk about how they function in the work. The end in view is to deepen and refine the percipient's awareness of the qualities that exist in the work. So criticism is a teacher. It's not saying nasty things at all about anything. It's illuminating what is subtle but significant. And that's in chapter 13 of Artist Experience. The second source of information or influence has to do with being a painter and getting feedback from my painting teachers so that I was aware of things that I hadn't noticed. So criticism is the production of ideas about an event or an object that's designed to enable them, a, a viewer, to take in more than they would have had the ability to take in without the benefit of the criticism. The role of criticism is a re-education of the perception of the work of art. Now criticism, a classroom is subject to criticism. A teaching performance is subject to criticism requires articulation. There are people who perceive but cannot criticize. That is, they cannot make the transition from what they have. I see what you mean, but I can't describe it, is what I'm talking about, somebody who says that to you. So, what you've got with criticism is an educational vehicle. And the reason it appealed to me is because I had been subject, my work had been subject to criticism by any number of people. The um, application of criticism to education was what was fresh, because Dewey himself didn't talk about criticism in the context of education, in the context of schooling, but more closely aligned with 
the context of fine art. And I was taking a shower one day and I got this idea that the development of perception was really important and that what does it mean to develop perception? Well, it means to become increasingly differentiated perceptually, to be able to see what is subtle and significant in some domain, not in all domains, it's too much to ask for. And then that that's one half of it, but the other half is how do you transform what you become accustomed, uh, aware of, into a public object that is shareable with others? Well, that requires language. It doesn't requ requires more than language, but to keep things tidy for the moment, it requires the ability to articulate in ways that make it possible for others to notice. So criticism is predicated on the ability to see or to notice what hadn't been noticed. I'm dwelling on this because it's a very important consideration. So the problem is to use language in a way that will be effective. Now, the use of metaphor and aesthetically designed or expressed observations is really quite important. And education and educational evaluation in particular needs a context in which being able to speak artistically, metaphorically, poetically is not only possible, is desired, rather than only factually, literally, mechanically. So the nature of the output, so to speak, has to suit its function. Let me give you one example. Uh, years ago I was doing some work for the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I was in Poughkeepsie, New York. And I went to visit some middle school there. So I walked into the school, introduced myself to the woman who was manning the gates of the main office. I said, I'm here from Stanford University to see the school. I think you have noticed that I was coming. Yes, indeed. He said, can we escort you to the room that you're going to be observing at least one of them? Fine. And before I was dropped off, she said to me, at the end of the day when you're through, our principal would like to talk to you. So I spent the day in the school. At the end of the day, I went to see the principal. principal says, would you sit down? Sit down. We started talking education. And the principal says to me sometime during the conversation, he says, you know, schools are places with very few soft surfaces. And I said, my God, schools are places with very few soft surfaces. That's a knockout. I'd been in schools all my life, and I never noticed that schools were places with very, but they, in fact, they are. The seats are hard, the wood is on the floor is typically hard. Uh, it's not designed like a home. It doesn't look anything like this living room. It, it's, it's hard rather than soft. It's geometric rather than curvilinear. Once you, be, you become aware of that possibility, you begin to look at schools, and I didn't have to go out and look at check schools out, because I'd been to schools, and I know that the, his observation was astute. Now once you recognize the astuteness and accuracy of that observation, even though it might not be perfect accuracy, then you can begin to ask other questions. Well, how did schools get to look this way? Just like, how did schools come to look like rows? When I went to school, there were rows six deep and eight across. And the smartest kid sat in the first row, first seat. The dumbest kid sat in the sixth row, eighth seat. 
the point is his observation and his ability to connect us to soft surfaces is a way of becoming conscious. No child left behind is now being subject its consequences to great concerns about the instrumentalizing of education. I don't know if you saw the paper yesterday, but uh, there are schools where they're paying kids for getting high scores and not paying them if they don't get high scores. So there's a whole set of ideas and considerations that one could take into account in making judgments about the appropriateness and possible consequences of that kind of an attitude towards education being cultivated. Greater exploration of non-linguistic forms for illuminating the consequences of schooling largely film and video I think are underused both in terms of training a word I don't like and in terms of displaying the consequences of teaching so I'd like to see a expansion of the forms of representation that are made available to students in order to get at what counts in schools. Now that has implications for teacher education. People need to know how to use a camera, how to make a film, how to edit appropriately, etc. I think we should be less preoccupied with tight little data sets and more open to the kinds of possibilities that rich forms of description make possible. The novel is not an inappropriate vehicle to use as a form for a dissertation for example, an idea that drives many people up a wall. But I think it will be coming over time that there will be an expansion of the ways in which people do their doctoral work and the forms that it takes. Because when you have a useful tool, it opens up possibilities that you wouldn't normally see with conventional resources. So I'd like to see students being encouraged to, as they say, work at the edge of incompetence in order to create images that reveal. Referential adequacy and structural corroboration are two criteria with which to make judgments about the adequacy. See, when that principal told me schools are places with very so few soft surfaces, I could have said, that's a hypothesis. I'm going to go out and visit five schools and see whether or not that's the case. I'm incidentally confident that that would be the case, that they would, there would be few places with soft surfaces. You get it in the kindergarten. But in, in that particular case, I have a whole backlog of experiences and images that I could draw upon to quote unquote validate the veracity of that observation. Now, if two critics disagree, what do you do? You talk about it. And you recognize that in complex forms, of outcomes. Debate and a critical examination is a part of the game. That's what happens today when people are dealing with great paintings or not so great paintings. There are differences. The difference is a part of the game. It's not like uh, something which is utterly predictable. See, we've, we've reduced schooling 
we reduced education to schooling and we reduced schooling to test scores which are appropriate for some things but not for everything and certainly not for most. Now there are complications involved and those complications pertain to the fact that it's time consuming. It's much easier to evaluate kids inadequate though it might be with uh, instruments that can be machine scored than to write insightful observations and narrative with respect to the performance of a student. Now, I would feel a lot better if the people leading the parade for bubble filling forms of testing, if they said, we're not entirely happy with this procedure, but it's the most efficient one that we've got right now. But that's not what happens. What happens is that those test scores are reified and taken as significant indicators of education. They also are predicated on the assumption that in, a, in an effective school, everybody is headed to the same destination and what you want to do is to make sure they all get there and pretty much on the same time. So you reduce variance in, in, in outcome as long as they hit the target. I take the view that in effective schools, variance is increased, not diminished. The distribution of scores is platycurtic rather than leptocurtic. Platycurtic means the distribution is tends to be flat, slight rise in the middle. Now why would such a notion be attractive to me? It's attractive to me because if you take a subject, let's say mathematics, and you acknowledge that some kids have higher degrees of aptitude in math than others, and that if you give everybody the same examination in mathematics, high aptitude math kids are going to do better than kids whose aptitudes are not so high in math. But the kids whose aptitudes aren't so high in math might do better in social studies. So what you've got is a diversity of outcome and that diversity increases over time. It's like a runner going around a track. There are two runners going around the track. At the end of the first lap, runner A is three yards ahead of runner B. By the time they get to the second track, runner A is six yards ahead of runner B. The space between them increases. That's one of the reasons why in reading, the field of reading, the uh, range of reading achievement in an elementary classroom is approximately equal to the grade level. At the second grade, there's a two-year spread. At the third grade, there's a three-year spread between the top and the... At the fifth grade, there's a five-year spread the variance is increasing. The idea is not to get everybody at the same place at the same time. You want to optimize everybody. In optimizing everybody, kids who are inclined towards a certain kind of performance are going to be ahead of those who aren't. So we do not want to put an artificial ceiling on learning. We want to optimize everybody. But in doing that, you spread kids out. That's what the leptocurtic, the platycurtic, distribution is about. You can find some good pieces in studies in art education. You can find some good commentary in my own work, if I might say so. Oh, for sure. yes. uh, if you want some good pieces on uh, qualitative research, let me come back to that for a moment. 
I'd refer you to Touching Eternity by Tom Barone, Doing School by Denise Pope, Life in Classrooms by Philip Jackson, my own book, The Enlightened Eye, which has ex excerpts. The difference between then and now in this qualitative research area is that now, three months ago, I got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Qualitative Special Interest Group of AERA. The Qualitative Research Interest Group at AERA has the largest membership of any of the SIGs in AERA. It has 500 members. Ten years ago, you might get 30 people at a meeting. So what's happened is that interest in qualitative research has increased and is expanding. And there are journals now that publish qualitative research and are devoted entirely to the qualitative research. And we have to recognize that it's going to come in many different forms. We do not want, I do not want, some kind of a uh, template with which to do qualitative research. How it's done ought to vary according to the talents and insights of the researcher. As far as DBAE is concerned, DBAE goes back, <clears throat> that's discipline-based art education, to some material that was written about by Jerome Bruner, Manuel Barkin, and myself in the 1960s. And it's predicated on the idea that if you're going to build a program in the visual arts, you better make it possible for kids to learn in four different domains. One is one domain is the domain of making an art object of some kind, a painting, a drawing, a lithograph, a ceramic piece, a sculpture, etc. So one kind of experience you want them to have is getting in to the material and making something that has aesthetic quality. Second domain has to do with becoming critical, having them learn how to see and talk about what they've made and what other people have made. A third has to do with understanding that art is a part of culture and that if you want to understand a work of art, whether it's contemporary or ancient, you need to know something about the culture in which it was made. And finally, the fourth thing is that since people argue about art, it's such a rich and open concept that it's important to have some background in aesthetic theory can a work of art be ugly, for example? How do you justify your conclusions about the value of a work of art? So you have these four domains, production, criticism, art history, and aesthetics, and you build a curriculum around these four. They could be integrated or they could be independent, but these are the four domains. And there should be some sense of sequentiality among the learning tasks involved. That was a uh, huge difference in attitude towards what you teach in the arts. If you apply those four principles, I'm going to show you something, to science, what you get is give kids an opportunity to make science, give kids an opportunity to critique science, give kids an opportunity to understand that science is a part of culture, give kids finally an opportunity to talk about and debate and discuss the nature of scientific 
thought, what makes a statement scientifically valid, for example. Now, you design a program in science that looks that way. I'll take it. That's well, you know, I ran, I ran a, a, an institute here for five years with Tom Barone. <clears throat> My voice is beginning to go. Uh, Arts, uh, an arts-based research institute. And we, we ran it every other year for, for over a five-year period. So we had over a 10-year period, we had five of these institutes. They came for two and a half days. And uh, it had a big effect, bigger than I anticipated, showing yes. people possibly. The problem that a lot of students had, they couldn't find on the faculty of their institution, thank you, faculty members who knew anything about it or who had an interest in trying. Did you talk to Tom Barone? You haven't. How have I changed as a researcher over time? I would say that I have come to realize the importance of interpretation. That even the artistic presentation of a set of ideas needs the support of an interpretive frame where you explain, usually in writing, the significance and the meaning of the events that you've described. I think that's a big change for me explication, interpretation have become much more important than they used to be. Uh, yeah, what I'm interested in thinking more and more about is the way in which aesthetic experience or art as experience are not owned by the fine arts but occur in law, medicine, as well as architecture, painting, dance, that they occur in principle or can occur in principle whenever individuals have intercourse with the world. So that we've been interviewing people who work in different pers professions to get them to talk about those moments in their work life that afford them the opportunity to have aesthetic experience. People who love their work often love it because of aesthetic experience, not just because they get paid, because they like who they are when they do it. They like what happens when they're engaged in it. So it's taking the concept of art or the aesthetic and broadening it to any kind of human activity in which the consequences of engagement is a certain character of experience, certain quality of experience. And it seems to me that's the probably one of the most important outcomes of schooling, to teach kids how to fall in love, to teach kids how to fall in love.